Safeguarding Press Bakes webinar. My name is Carrie Halley, and I'm the moderator for today's session. Today's webinar will start with a general overview of press brake safety and specific safeguarding techniques, then move into a deeper discussion, or sort of a compare and contrast, if you will, of electrosensitive protective devices, namely light curtains and camera-based laser AOPDs, or active optoelectronic protective devices. You have arrived in mute mode so that the presenter can speak clearly without background noise. We will have time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers, so please type your question in the chat box at any time during the webinar. Also, we invite you to provide feedback on our webinar today by participating in our poll after the Q&A session. Also, the presentation slides are available to download from your control panel under handouts. Your presenters today are Mike Spain with Rockford Systems and Carrie Holson with THCO is also on the line. So with that, we're ready to begin. Mike? Thank you, Carrie. Safeguarding press breaks, including electrosensitive protective device spotlight. Today we're going to look at different guarding methods for press breaks. We're actually not here to pick winners or losers. We're simply here to share our knowledge with you. Rockford Systems delivers innovative machine safeguarding solutions for organizations working with industrial machinery. Simply put, this is what we do. Today we're going to focus on press breaks. Our approach to machine guarding is to find the best solution for your machine by coming up with two or three safe solutions to fit you and your machine operators. Simply put, if your machine can be guarded, we can guard it for you. We're going to concentrate exclusively on press breaks today, but for background, I'd like to introduce some startling statistics on machine injuries in general. As reported in Safety and Health, a lack of machine guarding is consistently on OSHA's top 10 most cited violations report. Moving from number nine in 2015, number eight in 2016, and resulting in over $7 million in fines each year. Of course, the actual price tag for an injury is much higher than simply the OSHA citation, because indirect costs must be taken into account, such as damaged facilities or equipment, medical expenses, lawsuits, lost productivity, and replacement personnel. Worst of all, these accidents can cause very severe, potentially life-changing injuries or even death to employees. It is estimated that workers who operate and maintain machinery suffer approximately 18,000 amputations, lacerations, crushing injuries, abrasions, and most profoundly, more than 800 deaths each year. In 2016 alone, 88% of the total number of OSHA machine guarding violations were classified as serious, meaning one in which there is a substantial probability that death or serious physical harm could result, and the employer knew or should have known of the hazard. Press brake accidents. Press brakes are an unforgiving piece of machinery. The Department of Labor says there are over 350 amputations suffered each year in the United States. Keep in mind that many accidents are not reported to OSHA because of potential fines. We would expect the actual numbers to be much higher. So what, what makes a press break so hazardous? Small press breaks easily generate 40 tons of force, large ones several hundred. In forming small parts, the operator may need to hold the workpiece close to the point of operation, and that exposes them to danger. The two ends of the machine can also present a hazard, and to the operator or his assistant. What can happen is, when you feed a workpiece into the material, you've got the ends, or maybe you're trying to guide the workpiece into the machine, your fingers can curl around and be exposed to the mechanical hazard as the tooling closes. Finally, there's a device on a press brake called a back gauge. And what that does is it allows the machine operator to position his workpiece for the next bend. What it does is it follows the bending sequence of the workpiece, and it's usually powered by an electric linear actuator 
which creates a hazard of its own. And there are additional dangers included, including the use of poorly refurbished press brakes put into operation where primary controls or the condition of the machine and the safety system may be highly suspect. There are also dangers with brand new equipment. In the United States, OEMs oftentimes consider the point of operation to be the end user's responsibility and therefore do not install required guarding. In the United States, the owner of the machine is responsible and therefore liable. European standards and European machines are guarded when, uh, after they're manufactured and they leave the machine, or it, when the machine leaves its uh, point of manufacture, they're shipped already with the guarding in place. Fabricators really have safe members, I'm sorry, fabricators really have staff members with in-depth safeguarding competency to tap into plus even more rarely perform risk assessments, a key factor in all of this. We'll get into that a little bit later. Lastly, operating a press break is operator intensive. When two or more people are working together on the same press break, only one should be designated as the operator. This duty should never be shared. The operator in charge of the break should make certain that coworkers are clear of the press before beginning the bending process. Press break regulations. Now that we've established why press breaks are dangerous, Let's take a look at what is being done to make them safer. There are two safety codes to look at, OSHA 29 CFR 1910 and ANSI B113 2012. The ANSI B113 standard is the far more specific of the two. Plus, with the recent adoption of the European 12622 standard in the latest version, the updated B113 has largely removed many of the vague parts of its original. American standards often adopt European standards to augment or clarify an existing OSHA or ANSI standard. ANSI B113. B113 2012 is titled Safety Requirements for Press Breaks. It is the only safety system standard specifically applicable to power press breaks, and it excludes mechanical power presses, hydraulic power presses, hand brakes, tangent benders, apron brakes, and other similar types of bending machines. It discusses hazards associated with the point of operation and it identifies alternative guards and devices. For example, the close proximity point of operation, AOPD, safeguarding devices, which we're gonna discuss later. And a means of safeguarding referred to as safe speed. We should note that ANSI B11 TR3 recommends risk assessments of press breaks, among other equipment. This is a specialty service of Rockford Systems. If you have any questions regarding risk assessments, standards, or simply want to know how to get started, we'll give out my email at the end of today's presentation. You can ask me any questions that you may have. All right, now let's discuss press break safety training, which along with machine safeguarding make up the one-two punch for preventing injuries. First of all, you need to develop and enforce a written safety program. That means to incorporate clear, concise guidelines for operating machinery and performing tasks. Employees should be given a copy and provided training that emphasizes safe operating procedures, the limitations of equipment they are operating, use of guards, and hazard recognition and control. Employers should monitor employee compliance with all policies. Second, there's operator training. Training should be completed before the employee or operator is allowed to work near any equipment and the employer should maintain records of all training. Employees should be encouraged to report press break hazards and to make suggestions related to safety. Refresher training should also be conducted as needed. Manuals from the press break manufacturer are typically good sources of safety related information on potential hazards. Risk assessments. We talked briefly about assessments when reviewing ANSI standards. As the name implies, these assess hazard severity, frequency of exposure, and probability of injury. Risk assessments have proven over time to be the best and more comprehensive approach to establish a safe and effective safety system. There are no shortage of serious risks posed by press breaks ranging from amputations and crushing to even death. 
A risk assessment should be performed commissioning new machinery, including the furbished presses, or after the upgrading of the existing machinery or changing the area of work. In addition, it needs to be done after any accident or serious incident as part of an investigation. In general, it is good practice to perform a risk assessment every three years, even if no changes or accidents have been recorded. Safety basics, you know what? These really need to be repeated. It's worth it. Here we go. Keep work area clean, orderly, and free of oil, grease, and scrap. Use work supports, mechanical assists, or helpers when loading and unloading parts or heavy sheets. Wear PPE. Never wear loose clothing, watches, rings, etc. when operating machinery to avoid being dragged into danger areas. Never leave a machine running unattended. Keep your hands away from all moving parts, the RAM, work pieces. Avoid trip hazards with foot switch and cord. Always lock out, tag out before doing maintenance, no matter how small. Never use damaged dies. And never attempt to tamper with wiring or bypass safety control. When finished, position RAM at the bottom of stroke, lock out, tag out. Let's talk a little bit about press brake history. Press brakes have a long history. Hammers were the tools of choice for any blacksmith. That was until 1784 when a man named James Watt, a Scottish, a Scottish inventor and mechanical engineer, came up with co the concept of the steam hammer. The first steam hammer was built in 1840, which was revolutionary, the turning point for manufacturing with steel. We've come a long way since then, both in productivity and safety. Older press brakes, that as ones built prior to 1985, were mechanical, with a clutch or flywheel. Stopping times in these machines were long and that made using light curtains impractical. Generally speaking, if a machine was built after 1985, press brakes were hydraulic or electrically powered and that allowed for a much wider variety of safeguarding options. These machines had faster stopping times that allowed this to happen. Light curtains and two hand controls could then be used. Here are some options for guarding a press brake. Some are better than others, some advantages, some have drawbacks. Most basic type of safeguarding is a fixed or interlocked barrier guard coupled with a two-hand control. This is not a functional solution for fabricators as the workpiece is handheld close to where the work is being done. Another approach are pullbacks and restraints. Both of these are restrictive and have limitations. For that reason, operators don't like them. Both devices shackle the operator to a machine and it restricts the mobility. Another approach is a two-hand down foot-through device. In some cases, this will work. But this method raises ergonomic issues, and it's slow. It's not what you want in a busy, product-driven fabrication shop. If you take a look at the device in the upper right-hand corner there, that's a mechanical device that you can move up and down, and you can secure it in its location by tightening a bolt. When properly adjusted, they're very, very effective to prevent a person from getting into the point of operation. If you're going to guard a machine, you're basically going to do one of two things. You're going to keep people out or you're going to keep people away. That mechanical device there works really well at keeping people out, but it's not monitored by the machine. If you take those guards, raise them up all the way and leave a hole, the machine doesn't know that. Thereby, you're exposing your, your machine operators to that hazard. The same is true with the pullbacks that you see on the, that person's hands there, those yellow straps. Basically what they do is they restrict someone's access so they can't reach into the tooling where the mechanical hazard is present, right there at the point of operation. People with long arms, people with short arms, people with medium-sized arms, these things need to be adjusted to the specific physical needs of each machine operator. They have the same drawback that the mechanical guards do. If they're not properly adjusted, they don't work. Also, you could choose not to wear them. I've seen a number of times a person operating a press, they're feeding a workpiece, extracting a workpiece, and as the machine cycles, the pullbacks are moving up and down behind them on a pulley. Electrosensitive protective device spotlight. Now we will delve into some specifics on electrosensitive devices. Light curtain overview. 
Light Curtain started as a simple product detection device, and then they developed into a machine guarding product. Early safety light curtains used incandescent lamps strung together with a corresponding line of light detector, basically a reflector. One of the first machine safety applications that safety light curtains were used on were presses. A light curtain is a photoelectric presence sensing device. It protects against access into hazardous points and areas. They can range from very compact to large. Some are more robust than others. And there are others that have a very high degree of dual quality that can withstand demanding ambient conditions. There's some that you can get wet. There are some with an IP69K rating. You can get them oily. Some of them can resist uh, large amounts of shock and vibration. We should note that a stop time measurement device, or STM, is needed to calculate the safety distance on a regular basis, just as it is needed with two-hand controls. Here we've got a picture of a machine on the left-hand side there. I know that some of the people in, in attendance today know what a light curtain is, but a lot of you guys out there don't. The yellow bars on the front of the press on the left there are a light curtain transmitter and receiver. They're wired into a safety monitoring relay and a pair of magnetic motor starters, which are part of the machine's control circuit. A light curtain creates a field of vision using beams of invisible infrared light that are spaced about 20 millimeters apart. If you reach through the protected area, this press will either stop moving or it will not begin the next cycle until you pull your hand away. Safety light curtain safeguard personnel in the vicinity of point of operation hazards. This is done with an LED transmitter receiver. Any interruption of the plane of light by an object equal to or larger than the minimum object sensitivity initiates an output signal. It could be a hand, a finger, or a misplaced tool. This causes the machine to stop, or it doesn't allow a cycle until the blockage is removed. The safety distance between the light curtain and the machine depends on the application, the type of light curtain, and the machine's stopping performance. Light curtain blanking. This is a way to inc increase the machine's... Um, let me back up a second. Oh, that's muting. Blanking. A part bends up to the sensing field of a light curtain. It stops the cycle before it's finished. One of two things can be done to prevent this happening. One, just before the upper die touches the part, the light curtain can be automatically shut off for the balance of the cycle. This is referred to as muting. The light curtain during the hazardous, non-hazardous portion of the cycle, namely the obstruct, Basically, what muting does is it increases productivity by extending the life of the monitoring relays. This is safe, and it's recognized by ANSI B1119. If your light curtain is equipped with a floating blank feature, the part can bend up through the sensing field without stopping the cycle. This allows the light curtain to be active for the entire press break cycle, upstroke as well as downstroke. Floating blanking is usually selectable from either one beam or two beams, depending on the thickness of the part being bent. Simply put, if you're not blocking more than one or two beams at a time, as your workpiece swings up as it's formed, light curtain still functions. And the workpiece itself presents a barrier to the point of operation so that the machine operator can't get their hands where they don't belong. Light curtain regulations. The machine must be able to stop the movement of the ram anywhere in its stroke. This list of 10 things here is critical in order for you to consider putting a light curtain on a machine. The stopping time of the RAM must be known. The stopping time of the RAM must be monitored for deviation in stopping time on each stroke. The minimum distance the light curtain can be located to the pinch point must be known. A light curtain must be control reliable. The machine stop circuit with which the light curtains are interfaced must be control reliable as well. A light curtain must be self-checking for operation on each stroke. There should be no easy way to disable the safety system without special tools. If the safety system is disabled, there should be a clear indication that it is disabled. And finally, the operator and setup person should be properly trained in the operation of the safety system. If you have any questions or any doubts about how this works, if you've got a press break that you're considering putting a light curtain on, these 10 things must always be considered. If you've got questions, 
let us know. We can help you out with that. Camera-based laser safety system overview. Active optoelectronic protected device, or an AOPD. This allows you to be right at the point of operation. It gives you close proximity to the point of operation. An AOPD system is best suited for applications where you have an application where you're forming a box or you're forming a workpiece that has flanges or in applications where the light curtain effectiveness is diminished due to excessive blanking or muting. AOPDs were invented in 1998. Laser active optic protected device systems were primarily used in the European Union. Today, four manufacturers make them. In 2003, laser AOPD started coming into use in the United States as a retrofit solution for existing press brakes. Laser AOPD has since become standard system for many press brakes, both on imported machines and those manufactured locally. This is important here. Inclusion of laser AOP to AOPD technology in the B113 standard is a welcome addition. It gives dealers, users a clear guideline to implement this technology safely. ANSI B113 subclause 8.8.7, close proximity point of operation AOPD safeguarding device. They call it out specifically and allow people to use this now. The biggest advantage of AOPD is that operators can handhold pieces up close to the dies. While using a foot switch to actuate the machine cycle, which is almost impossible to safely accomplish using a light curtain. Another advantage is for larger piece parts with tall side lights that would be difficult when using a vertically mounted light curtain for safeguarding. For those familiar with using light curtains on press brakes, those two situations often require extensive channel blanking, which does allow for production of those parts, but often lets the hands and fingers to reach too close to the dies. Laser saves Sentinel Plus operation. The mute point is easily set according to the material position and optically verified automatically in each cycle. There's a graphic interface. It's got a magnet on it so you can put it where the work is being done or where the operator stands. It's an interface panel which displays the system and machine status in real time. You can see that little box right there on the machine where it says Sentinel Plus. There are multiple modes available to suit any shape and profile of workpiece. Integrated status LEDs for simpler and faster setup and adjustment, automatic monitoring of speed and stopping performance, quick adjust bracket brackets with tool lock to keep the transmitter receiver clear during tool change, automatic tool alignment for simple tool change that takes only a matter of seconds. Here we've got a picture of a machine that's in our training facility. It's an AOPD combined with light curtains. In this case, the vertical light curtain has been provided for die configurations that the AOPD won't handle, like compound bends, for instance. This is done to ensure that safeguarding is provided for all die setups. For die setups where neither light curtain or AOPD offers effective guarding, but the part can be fixed in place, meaning it does not require hand support, a two-hand control could be used for safeguarding. You can see the little control box there at the right of the machine. This machine here gives uh, a, a very, com uh, it's a great illustration of what a complete guarding solution looks like. If you notice, you can see the aluminum extrusion mounted to the sides of the machine and the expanded wire mesh. Here we've achieved what we would call the over, under, around, or through of the safeguarding solution. You can't reach around, you can't reach over, you can't reach under. You can feed work pieces into the machine and extract work pieces from the machine You've got a guarding solution there in place to keep people safe. Light curtains versus AOPD. As this diagram shows, the laser AOPD protects the point of, the point of hazard, or as light curtain systems restrict operator access to the point of hazard. You can see that here in the pictures down at the bottom of the page. Due to this design, operators can handhold piece parts up close to the dies with the AOPD. Look at that there on the left. As the punch moves up and down, the AOPD system moves with it following the tip of the tool. Whereas with a light curtain on the right-hand side, 
we have to put a field of vision a distance from where the work is being done. Distance equals time. That's what keeps us safe when using a light curtain. A light curtain doesn't monitor the speed, the position of the machine, doesn't monitor the stop time in the machine, whereas an AOPD does. And that's what allows us to put it right there where the work is being done. This is virtually impossible to accomplish using a light curtain. It just doesn't have the built-in monitoring that an AOPD does. Here we've got a side-by-side -side comparison of a light curtain against an AOPD. What's important to note here is you can put a light curtain or an AOPD on a brand new or retrofitted on a machine. A risk assessment will guide us toward whether or not your machine is compatible with one or the other solution. If your machine can be guarded, we can help you out with that. But you can't put a light curtain on every machine and you can't put an AOPD on every machine. Sometimes only one is better, or sometimes you need both. And in virtually every case, there's some form of hard guarding or some modification to the system mechanically in order to mount it properly and have it work for you. Pros and cons. A light curtain is less expensive. There's less setup time for tooling and parts changes. And new, new light curtains do have programmability and features that allow bending difficult parts. Today's light curtains, you can program in a bending sequence. So if you've got a stack of parts that you want to form, or if you're forming the same thing over and over again, a light curtain can be programmed to remember six, seven, eight different bending sequences for your machine operator. On the flip side, an AOPD has built-in box bending, and uh, uh, it can also accommodate the forming of a flange very, very easily. It's much, and it's uh, also faster with, with smaller work pieces, whereas a light curtain doesn't allow you that added flexibility. Downside to a light curtain, it's difficult to bend parts with flanges. You could also engage in what we call muting abuse, which makes the machine unsafe by overmuting or blanking. Light curtains also have a dramatic effect on, on uh, the parts that you feed through the machine, so it slows down your production. An older light curtain spending smaller parts is possible, but it can be complicated. Again, you can program in the bending sequence and have the light curtain essentially remember, but you have to do that every time you change the part. An AOPD, although it's far more flexible, it has a higher price, in some cases four or five times the cost. There's a setup time associated with tooling changes. There are restrictions on safe use with tooling. And it does not work with all tooling. So if you've got larger radius or flattening guys or you're doing hemming and flattening, you take a look at that profile picture there where it's got the red rectangle. That is a, a gooseneck guy, which is relatively small. And the point of operation can be very effectively managed, managed or monitored by the sensing field of an AOPD. If that tool becomes wider or deeper, the sensing field of an AOPD may not be big enough to protect you from the, the sloped front or the rear of the tooling. And, there, and thereby, it would be uh, unable to protect operators from most setup uh, bending applications. Light curtains versus AOPD. So, which is the best choice for your organization? You know what, guys? It really depends on the application. There is no winner or loser. You know, in that last slide that we just discussed, Although it was kind of quick, it kind of gave you a nice side-by-side -side comparison of what is the better route to go. I can't tell you which one's better. Every device we discussed today provides a safe work environment for your machine operator when properly installed. But we guard according to the needs of the machine. So I can't tell you whether or not a light curtain is better or an AOPD is better. I can tell you if it's going to be compatible or not. And, then, and uh, if there's a additional work in the setup or in the wiring, we can give you a sense of that say, over the phone. But um, when it comes down to it, we have to perform an assessment. We have to take a look at the machine. We have to see how you use it, take a look at your machine operators, how many that you've got. And then we can give you a definitive answer as to whether or not one or the other is the better choice for your machine. So if your machine can be guarded, we can help you. Rockford Systems is an authorized laser safe distributor, and we can help get you started.